الوحدة والصلاة والسلام على من لا نبي بعده أما بعد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الخمر والميسر والأنساب والأزلام رجس من عمل الشيطان فاجتنبوه لعلكم تفلحون صدق الله العظيم رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل الأقدة من لساني يفقه قولي سبحانك لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم Mr. Chairman Distinguished and Honorable Ulama My brothers and friends in Islam, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. It is very heartening to listen to Shaykh Anasuddin bring to our attention the importance of sending greetings and salutations. upon our master and our messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam may I therefore ask all of us wholeheartedly with tremendous love to send greetings and salutations upon Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands us to do so as an order and as praise of his beloved Nabi. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad yum wa ala ala Muhammad kama sallayta ala Ibrahim wa ala ala Ibrahim innaka hamidun majid. Allahumma barik ala Muhammad wa ala ala Muhammad kama barakta ala Ibrahim wa ala ala Ibrahim innaka hamidun majid. A couple of weeks ago, I received a telephone call from Sheikh Riyadh al-Haq about gambling. My immediate response was that that is the duty or the job of the, the mufti. Because I felt that there is no Muslim, hand on heart, who does not know the fifthy position of gambling in Islam and in Sharia. We have all accepted those gathered. Allah, like with other commandments of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, mankind, including Muslims, overlook them and transgress in the eyes of Allah. Going back to the introduction of Shaykh Ahmad, in which he gave us the four methods of rectifying ourselves, especially spiritually, was the third method of learning from others. The few pages that I have with me. Unfortunately or fortunately, depending on the way we look at it, contain a sad story of a Muslim family. The idea is not to ridicule anybody or to make a mockery of someone 
or to laugh at their misfortune. The idea behind it is to learn that we do not fall into that trap ourselves. Therefore we hear Sa'idu man wa'idha bighayri The fortunate person The lucky person Is the one who learns from the mistakes of others May Allah keep us all in His protection and His safety But say for example if one of you were to leave the hole and there is a brick lying on the ground and you knock your foot on the brick and you trip over and you fall down and I have seen that happen to you despite that I follow in your footsteps knock my toes on the brick and fall over that is my stupidity my inability of not learning from the mishap that has occurred to you I am an unfortunate person that I cannot learn from your mistake that I go on and do exactly what happened to you. The sad stories I have with me are not only of Muslim brothers and sisters, but they include the general public of this country. When the topic was allocated to me, I decided I would not touch upon the pity aspect, but rather I would share with you some of the things that are available as Sheikh Ahmed rightly pointed. I went surfing on the internet and I visited our local reference library. The information there is so much on one single topic I feel if we were to spend the three days of our youth Tarbiya conference talking about this subject bringing that information here the three days would not be sufficient yes indeed the knowledge is there in our library and wherever it is the information I hope that when we conclude after this talk the information we will turn it into knowledge and put it into practice gambling is not a new thing it has been happening for thousands and thousands of years and throughout these hundreds and thousands of years it has undergone Tremendous changes And as the year, years go by we find new and more new forms of gambling A very recent one being the National Lottery Which is going to see its fourth anniversary and the instant scratch card I can see a lot of young friends seated here Inshallah, there is a very amusing cartoon from one of the major newspapers, broadsheet newspapers. I'm sure you'll find it amusing, but it is an eye-opener for all of us. We will come to that in a few moments. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reminds us to stay away from all evil. And in the verse of the Qur'an al-Kareem that I have recited, alcohol and gambling generally have been mentioned. Allah says that, فَجْتَنِبُوا Stay away from that, لَعَلَّكُمْ تُفْلِحُونَ So that you may be successful. 
Now, if you and I were to sit here and think about success, yes, a big fat wallet is good enough success for this worldly life. Which is what is making all these people rush to the lottery booth twice a week. Now it's twice a week, not once. It wasn't enough. Twice a week to try and get rich very, very quickly. I had a brief chat with some of my friends about my topic. One of my friends said to me, it was him, the man who won the, at that time, what was the biggest amount of money to be won on the National Lottery. Our Muslim brother. My friend said to me, we believe as Muslims, in the fact that whatever is sustenance, wealth, property that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has allocated for each and every individual is going to reach him, is going to reach her. In other words, this brother who won that big amount of money, Allah has written it down for him. And had he waited, surely he would have got that in the halal way. And I had to agree with him. Because we firmly believe that we shall not die until we have eaten the last morsel of food, the last grain that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has written down for us. And over the past few weeks, especially the last two weeks, having known my topic, I've been dwelling upon it. And thinking about what is the main driving force behind this great evil. And I've been talking to friends, We felt that it all boils down to greed. Greed. To want more. More than what Allah is willing to give us. More than what Allah will surely give us. And to want it quickly. The food that Allah is going to feed us tomorrow, we want to eat it today. The wealth that Allah will give us tomorrow, we want it today. Or should I say, we want it yesterday. And I feel that at the end of the talk, we shall all agree that greed is an illness that we need to remove from our hearts, from our lives. I have with me a very colourful brochure. Very colourful brochure. The problem here is gambling is such a great evil that those who promote it also realise it and therefore they want to colour it in the colours of good or good causes. They call it the National Lottery Good Causes. Very good causes, they think. And as soon as we open the brochure, line one says, everybody knows what the National Lottery is. Thanks to me, those who didn't know, now already know. And they know how it is played and how big the prizes are. But not so many of us understand what it does. How true, how true that statement is. So many of us do not understand what it does to us.
And because time is limited, I am going to focus around the National Lottery itself. Because it is a contemporary form of gambling. And we have our so-called leaders in the government who are trying to dispel true concerns of the people, of the residents of this country. National Heritage Secretary Mrs. Bottomley, Virginia Bottomley, went on record before I read out what she said. I looked up the introduction of the National Lottery about four years, which gives us, if I divide them into six monthly periods, we have about eight six monthly periods. Because there was so much information there, I had to be very, very selective. And somehow I ended up selecting the second period of six months since the launch of the lottery. And I have collected information about incidents that happened only in those six months to sample. Every six month period is full of this. And it gets worse by the day. When the concerns were raised by the public, concerned parents, even church leaders, that the lottery was not a good thing for Britain. Mrs. Bottomley had this to say. In reply to all this, this is what she had to say. Much misleading nonsense has been put about. The concerns that were raised that children are falling into the habit of gambling, grown-ups and adults are falling into the habit of gambling, she calls it all nonsense. And she says, according to her, the facts are clear, the National Lottery has been a tremendous success for the millions of people who play and enjoy it each week. Corruption from the top. Corruption of the heart. Spiritual corruption. Not any other kind of corruption. Spiritual corruption. At that time, this is a news release of the Department of National Heritage, dated 25th of October 1995, very close to the launch of the lottery. And at that time, they said that around 30 million people. Now, throughout my talk, you shall hear a lot of numbers. And I, I apologize for that, but the numbers are critical. They are vital and they are important so that we can see the magnitude of what is involved, both, both in terms of numbers of people and in terms of how many pounds, how much money. And it says here, around 30 million people play the national lottery each week Three out of four households. Seventy-five percent of the population play the lottery. Our homes, the homes of Muslims, are part of that three out of four households. Some people have complained about this, saying that we are encouraging people to spend money that they cannot afford on the lottery. People don't have the money and we are making them spend it twice a week now to buy the lottery ticket. And Mrs. Bottomley goes on to say that independent evidence from the Family Expenditure Survey shows that on average each household spends about two pounds a week 
making it sound so petty two pounds a week with the wealthiest income group spending more so what she's saying is the poor people spend only two pounds a week on gambling on lottery the wealthy people maybe 10 pounds 20 50 100 maybe more and she dispels or rejects everything as nonsense the concerns of the people who raise these concerns she regards them as nonsense now you help me decide whether it is truly nonsense or what she had to say is nonsense <coughs> I've arranged my extract in chronological order at first I, I intended to to put the least uh, the stories that would have a, a lesser impact first with those having a bigger impact at the end then I changed my mind and I said, let us hear it in chronological order. As the days went by, the series of occurrences, how it all happened, day by day. And I've come for six months, going back to three years. I had the choice of several newspapers. I decided to go for the Daily Telegraph. Uh, simply because it was easy for me to take the mouse there and the cursor then click on it and the Daily Telegraph CD-ROM opened up and I went into that so I sufficed with that this article by Nigel Bunyan 13th of May 1995 he starts in a very amusing way when I read it I myself was amused he says the giant a glittering finger pointed at the man in the street and announced it could be you and many of us have seen that advert the big finger comes down and it points at somebody my friend let us remember Malakul Maut is out there his finger is pointing it could be you. Let us bear that in mind. We have to meet our Creator. He is going to ask us, Did you not believe that I would feed you? Did you not believe that I would serve you? Did you not believe that I would give you your daily bread? If you did believe, why then did you resort to means of greed? I remember Sheikh Anasuddin's introduction about the difficulties of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the pain that he went through for this ummah. the meager supply of food in his home, in his household when his beloved wife, our mother Ummuna Sajidatu Aishata radiallahu ta'ala anha says that we used to spend our days on two black things days and water we had nothing more than that to eat and feed ourselves with and when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala offers him, he sends the angels down, O oh Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, if you command, if you so desire, if you wish, then the mountains that you see around you, I shall turn them into gold for you, and they shall walk with you. And what did Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam have to say? said, my Lord, my Allah, I would rather you feed me one day and you keep me hungry the following day that I may be thankful to you, that I may show gratitude to you, that I may turn to you, ask from you and remember you. Many of my friends here or some of my friends here might be in, might belong to the business community. 
May Allah bless you in your businesses. You are vital to the Muslim community. But beware. Somewhere out there are unscrupulous people. What my young friends might call dodgy people. And they will come to you with different offers of trade and business. This company, that company, you invest in this company, the, terms, the returns will be so good. You buy shares in this company, the results will be so good. You make such a big profit. You must be very careful with these people. Many companies have misled people. Unfortunately, our Muslim brothers included, they have absconded with their money, declared themselves bankrupt, and everything is lost. Let us be careful. If anything, ask your friends. Make sure. Sample invest a little to see if it's true, if it's going to work or not. Coming back to the subject at hand. The finger is pointing. The Nigel starts his article and says, the finger is pointing. And he says, six months later, this is six months since the lottery was launched, he says, some of the ordinary people whose lives have been so radically altered by natural lottery riches are saying, the people who won the money on this Losses are now saying, I wish it had been somebody else. I wish that finger had not pointed at me. When Malakul Maut will visit us, that is exactly how we will feel if we have not kept Allah happy. Think about it, friends. What are we showing to Allah when we indulge in something that is unlawful? For example, gambling. We are saying to Allah, Allah, I do not trust you. I do not trust you. You will not feed me tomorrow, therefore I am gambling. So I can win something, feed myself and my family. That is what we are saying to Allah. We move on. There has also been a steadily mounting human cost. On the one hand, we're talking about families spending on average two pounds a week, the rich are spending a little more. Human cost. Human life is priceless. We cannot attach a price tag to human life. Life is from Allah. It is the order of Allah. The Messenger of Allah was questioned about life, about our soul. The Quran has put it down in writing for us. Yes, Aluna Kani wrote. And the Messenger of Allah replied, Allah told him that answer these people who are asking you about the roof, about life. What is life? To live roof in an umbrella. The life that you have, the pumping heart that is inside your body, that is passing life to every limb inside you, every organ inside you, it is doing so by the order of Allah, the command of Allah. A life has no price. Nobody can buy life. The damage and the harm that the National Lottery has, or gambling in general has, is not only monetary and financial, it is costing human life. Even if it is non Muslim, life is life, human life is human life. There has also been a steadily mounting human cost. 
the suicide of Tim O'Brien. He killed himself, and if you are wondering why, he won the lottery. He won the lottery, but he failed to renew his numbers for the week they came up. He could not forgive himself, and he killed himself. And there are tales and stories of recrimination as relationships collapse into squabbles over who bought the ticket. The husband is fighting with the wife over who actually bought the winning ticket. Who picked the number? Or who agreed to share how much with whom? Squabbling and fighting. And to think that just not long ago, they were happily married. Allah had given them a little. They were satisfied. Their children had all the basic needs. And life was going on. All of a sudden, they have more than they can digest. And so they begin to fight. It says here, yesterday came the news that the winner of the largest lottery prize had been arrested with two relatives after a row at a family party at Gerard Cross in Buckinghamshire. They had won the lottery and they were celebrating with friends and there was a row there and they got arrested. The 43-year-old winner of 17.8 million pounds. These figures are nothing compared to the wealth of the hereafter, my brother. The wealth of the hereafter is what matters. This is just for our understanding of what figures are involved. The 43-year-old winner of 17.8 million pounds in December allegedly bundled the men into a car, drove to a police station, to ask that they all be arrested, including himself. You know, we talk about money getting to somebody's head, an ideal example. Bundled everybody into car, goes to the police station, says, arrest everybody, including myself. A few hours later, they were all released, without charge, after they had a chance to cool off in the cell. Then off he went on a holiday. And after returning from a two-month trip to East Africa, the winner, his wife, and their three children tried to settle in the Southeast under a new name. The dangers of having so much wealth by utilizing the wrong means. You will agree with me, had this man acquired that 17.8 million through local and halal means, he would not need to change his name, he would not need to go into hiding. He would have been fortunate to be able to share that wealth with the masajid, with the Islamic institutions. I'm so proud of Muslim honor that when offers of these kinds of monies were made to the masajid, they rejected them. Well done. So he changed his name, he changed his home. And now his old friend, his old friend, you find some examples here, time permitting we shall see them. People who won the national lottery say that We've been receiving telephone calls and letters from friends who haven't contacted us for over 50 years. When you don't have money, you don't have friends. That is the ideology of these people. True wealth. In the Lagina, Lagina, enough. True witness, true wealth is the contentment of the heart. If you have one piece of bread today, Alhamdulillah. If you have three, still Alhamdulillah. 
something that we have been taught by our dear Prophet Muhammad Back in Blackburn, where he worked in a chemical factory for 15 years, former friends speak of how he left the town, never visited his mother. This is what haram money makes us do. The woman who bore him for nine months, who went through all the pain that we know of, who fed him, who looked after him, who cleaned him. Now he has so much money, he doesn't want to know his mother. What good is that wealth? <coughs> When Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa says, Paradise lies at the feet of your mother. Serve her, keep her happy, and you shall gain paradise. This man would rather have his 17.8 million, forget his mother. These are the, the consequences of halal, haram action. And it says here that he gave nothing to his brother. Sheikh Anasuddin was telling us of the day of Qiyamah, which is very, very true. In the ayat, in the light of the Qur'an al karim he told us how a brother shall run from a brother. But that won't be for 17.8 million pounds. It will be for one hasana, one sawab, one good deed. This man did not share anything with his brother. His employers at William Blythe Chemical Works received a brief resignation letter. He's got money, he doesn't need to work anymore. He left the firm. It says here, unconfirmed newspaper reports that he planned to give 200 of his former colleagues Forty thousand pounds each as a gift because we worked with them for fifteen years. And he didn't do that. Not very surprising. Shortly before his record win, the family moved into a big house and so on and so forth. And he says, A friend said, According to the law of Islam, the lottery is a sin that will destroy you. Before he won, he said he just wanted enough to pay off his mortgage and buy a new car. Now he's got nearly 18 million pounds and I would guess he's more miserable. He carries on, it is not only the multi-millionaire winners who have been made unhappy. Fred Baker, 64 years old, was one of the syndicate of elderly people. Even they are not content. One foot is dangling in the grave. It's greed. Greed. He joined with a few friends and together they bought some tickets. It says here he was the only man among the eight winners, his seven friends and himself, eight winners, who lived in a private block of flats. The lottery had been a social activity, part of the group's regular coffee morning. Today, after winning 220,000 pounds each, they never get together. Every morning they would meet friends, sit down, have a coffee, have a tea, chat, spend some time together. After they've won, they have no time for that. Since I won the money, I have been more lonely than ever before, said Mr. Baker. We used to meet two or three times a week, but that has stopped now. Since the win, we all seem to have gone our different ways. You have no money, you have no friends, you have money, then again you have no friends. Because the money came to illegal, to haram. 
period. We're running out of time, but inshallah, I shall pick out the main points and share them with you. I feel that if we look at the mistakes of others and then try our hardest not to fall into the same, into the same trap as they have, then inshallah, these few minutes we have shared together will be very, very valuable. Following that, July 15, 1995, an article by Hugh Moore says, Britain's first 18 million pounds national lottery winner and his wife are struggling to save their marriage. They have a name here, which like I said, I, I have to read it out, not to ridicule him or to mock him or to make fun of him, but it is in the papers, it is there for the public to read and for us to derive lessons from his mistakes. Mukhtar, 38 years old, and his wife Saida, 33 years old, have had serious difficulties since his win last November. They cannot agree who has the rightful claim to the money or how it should be spent. The first question is whether the parties operated on a common curse they had their money together, husband and wife, put your money together. Did they take the one pound from that common money? Or the second question is, if they took it from that common money, did the prize belong to them jointly? Because it was joint money, the ticket bought from joint money, the prize should belong to them jointly. Oh, now even the lawyers are having headaches. People with millions of pounds, the lawyers have headaches. Would it be relevant, would it be a relevant fact that the actual one pound coin came out of Mukhtar's pocket? Physically, he fished it out from his own pocket at the counter. So does that mean that all the money belongs to Mukhtar? Or is it that because they used to put the money together, they should share it? Again, it grief, my dear brothers. I cannot understand why, for argument's sake, they couldn't have said, okay, 17.8 million, 8.5 million, 8.9 and 8 million for you, 8.9 million for me, you go your way, I go my way. But greed, you want all of it. If I must have it, I must have all of it. That is the problem, the underlying, underlying problem. The three children, now they have, they have three children. The ch three children aged 13, 9 and 6. May Allah look after them. It is so saddening. It is so sad, 13, 9 and 6 year old, they are now, they are now wards of court. The courts are looking after them to date, uh, until that day, I am not sure of the latest news on that, but until 15th of July 1995, the courts had taken custody of three Muslim children. And what for? For what? money. We lost three Muslim children to the court for money. He was a happy man. Fifteen years loyal, loyalty with one firm. He was happy. He looked after his children. They were happy. This is the, this is, these are the consequences of transgressing the laws of Allah. And there is more. There is more. July the 16th, 1995. Article by Oliver Brett. The Daily Telegraph. He starts. 
they may be 20 million pounds better off. But the Benson family feel they have had a hellish week after picking up the biggest national lottery jackpot so far. On Friday night, they were still holed up in their house with members of the tabloid press camped outside waiting for the first sign of family tension. They're waiting for it. It's like a big, big, big drama. They thrive on the misfortune of others. So the family is in the house, all the press people are outside. They cannot go to the window, they cannot exit the house. To cut a very long story short, I come to the bottom line. The wife in the house said, she comes to the door, tells to the press people, I have said all that I'm going to say, now all I want is to be left in peace. And the writer of this article carries on to say, but she may not be so lucky. She's lucky enough to win the lottery, but she's not lucky to be left in peace. Because the lottery organizers, it's funny. You win the money, but they don't give it to you and leave you alone. No. Camelot believes it has a duty. It has a duty to stay in touch with big women and make many of their most important decisions for them. So you can't even spend it the way you want. That's a few points on that.